the Leon Panetta 2023 Lecture Series. The theme this year is the presidency and a divided Congress. Can they govern? This lecture discusses the economy and inflation. Can we avoid a recession? Please welcome Sylvia Panetta. Good evening. How wonderful it is to be here back in person, live audience. Thank you for being here to join us for the uh, first lecture of the 2023 season. It's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you back to the Leon Panetta Lecture Series live here in Leon's hometown of Monterey at the Monterey Conference Center. It's almost exactly three years to the day that Monterey County issued the shelter in place order in an attempt to halt the spread of the COVID virus. Three years later, we can be proud of the resilience and ingenuity of the crisis in that, that this crisis inspired. For example, the Leon Panetta Lecture Series went out live with Zoom at the time. We continue to reach out to knowledgeable experts and leaders and to host discussions about the most pressing issues facing our nation. Today, we're now able to once more have these forums in front of a live theater audience and how wonderful it is to be back together again. As ever, there is much to discuss. This season, our theme is the presidency and a divided Congress. And we'll ask the question, can they govern? Tonight, our focus is on the economy. Concerned about the economic impact of the pandemic, the US government pumped roughly $5 trillion into the economy the largest flood of federal money in recorded history. This action is largely credited with preventing the United States from sinking into depression. But the stimulus combined with other factors like supply chain shortages and the war in Ukraine led to historically high inflation. In an attempt to keep the economy stable for that past 12 months, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to try and bring inflation in check and at the same time avoid a recession. It is a dangerous balancing act complicated by the cost of the ongoing war in Ukraine, new concerns about the stability of the banking sector and the pending debate over the debt ceiling issues that could certainly push the economy into a recession. The fragile fate of our economy is left in the hands of the Federal Reserve and our elected leaders. It is the Fed, is the Fed making the right decisions on interest rates? Are regulators effectively dealing with bad management and banking? Can the President and the Congress work together to avoid economic crisis? Leon will pose these questions to four leading economic experts. Our first guest is internationally recognized for his research on world economic growth, tax and budget theory, and policy, saving and consumption patterns and the implications of changing technology and demography on capital, labor, and product markets. He served as chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, called the CEA, from 1989 to 1993, when he helped resolve the third world debt and savings and loan financial crises. His CEA was rated by the Council for Excellence in Government as one of the five most respected agencies in the federal government. 
He later chaired the highly influential Blue Ribbon Commission on the Consumer Price Index, whose report has transformed the way government statistical agencies around the world measure inflation, GDP, and productivity. Presently, he is the Wolford Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Tully, Tully M. Friedman Professor of Economics at Stanford. So please help me welcome Dr. Michael Boskin. Our second guest is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and widely respected expert in presidential politics. He has served as White House correspondent for CNN and chief Washington correspondent for CNBC and has offered political analysis for the New York Times, NBC, MSNBC, NPR, and PBS. He has covered each of the last nine presidential elections. As White House correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, he covered the presidency of George H.W. Bush and later reported on Congress before becoming the journal's political editor and chief political correspondent. Among many journalistic accomplishments, he received an Emmy nomination for his live CNBC town hall with President Barack Obama. He also moderated the Republican presidential debates on CNBC in 2011 and 2015. He is the co-author with Gerald F. Sieb of the book Pennsylvania Avenue, Profiles in Backroom Politics and Power, published in 2008. Please welcome John Harwood. Our next guest is the president of the Bipartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget and an expert on budget, tax, and economic policy. As a leading budget expert for the past 20 years and a political independent, she works closely with members of both parties and serves as a trusted resource on Capitol Hill. She works mainly on issues related to fiscal, tax, economic, and retirement policy, and has been called an obsessively nonpartisan, data-driven, well-connected champion of fiscal responsibility and an anti-deficit warrior. She testifies regularly before Congress. It's, uh, she is a frequent commentator on television and has published broadly, including regularly in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Atlantic, and numerous other outlets. Her most recent area of focus is on the future of the economy, technology, and capitalism. Please welcome Maya McGinnis. Our final guest is one of the world's leading economic scholars, an expert in economic history and macroeconomics. She is best known for her work on the causes of the Great Depression, the subsequent recovery, and the, con on the conduct and effects of monetary and fiscal policy. She has also researched the effects of economic growth and inflation and the effects of the cuts on private investment and government spending. From January 2009 until September 2010, she served as chair of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. In that role, she helped formulate the response to the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent recession of contributed and to, she contributed to the development and passage of President's health reform legislation. 
Presently, she is the Garth B. Wilson Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Her current research focuses on the impact of financial crises in advanced economics. Please welcome Dr. Christina Romer. Moderating our discussion is the man who created this lecture series, the former United States representative for this district, chairman of the House Budget Committee, director of the Office of Management and Budget, where his work helped to achieve a balanced federal budget. He was the chief of staff for Bill Clinton, director of the CIA, and then, of course, Secretary of Defense. So please welcome our own Secretary Leon Panetta. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the first of uh, our lectures of the 2023 Panetta Lecture Series live and in person. It's great to be back at the Monterey Conference Center and great in particular to be back with a live audience. We have in this lecture series always focused on the challenges facing our democracy. Our theme this year is the presidency and a divided Congress. Can they govern? And tonight, in particular, we worry about the economy and whether anyone in Washington can effectively deal with a banking crisis, high inflation, rising interest rates, and an economy that could very well slide into a recession. And as if that were not enough, we have a record national debt of over $31 trillion an annual deficit over a trillion dollars. We also have the possibility of a default on our good faith and credit if Congress fails to pass an increase in the debt limit. We have a war in Ukraine. Is it any wonder that people are worried about economic uncertainty? What will it take to restore economic stability and confidence? Is the banking system sound and resilient, as Chairman Powell stated? Where is the balance between government regulation and a free market economy? And can the President and a divided Congress work together on fiscal discipline and the debt ceiling? These are tough questions in very tough times. But it's a good time to ask our distinguished speakers for their thoughts on all of these challenges related to our economic future. Let me begin with the news that we saw in the headlines recently. In the New York Times this past week, it was a headline, Banking Crisis Fans Fears That a Recession Will Strike the U.S. Prior to the bank failure, there was some hope that a strong, an economy that had strong consumer spending, low unemployment, a good job market, uh, and some signs that inflation was coming down, that we would have a soft landing. But the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, the Signature Bank, troubles with First Republic, Credit Suisse, and others have raised fears about whether or not we might be headed into a recession. So let me begin with that question. Has the bank crisis, along with inflation, interest rates, and a possible default, made a recession more likely in 2023? And give me your sense about the state of our economy at the present time. Well, we'll start with you, Michael. Thanks, Leon. The state of our economy right now is very uncertain. Uh, we've had a resilient economy. Our job market has stayed resilient. Uh, many firms have had a very difficult time hiring workers, which is unusual to have 1.8 or 
uh, job openings for every unemployed person. And so part of what will determine whether we head into a recession is whether firms will continue to so-called hoard labor, worrying that if they lay too many people off, they'll have a very hard time hiring them back. So it's possible that that will cushion the downturn, but as some sort of a slowdown or recession is likely, uh, partly because we've had this inflation, uh, core inflation has come down very slowly. It has come down a bit. It's still way above the Fed's 2% target. It's running 5% or so in round numbers. Uh, the canon in the central banks, including the Fed, is they have to keep their short-term interest rate target above the inflation rate for some period of time to eventually turn inflation down with an unpredictable long lag. So I think there's going to be some pain from that. And you can't not run an economy for 15 years with basically very, very low short-term interest rates and not expect when the chickens, chickens to come home to roost, when that game ends and you have to raise rates to ward off inflation, well, there's going to be some bad decisions going to be made. But relative to the banking crisis, thus far, those are very modest-sized banks. I worry that there's still some confusion about whether um, deposits above the Federal Reserve, a Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation um, maximum will be insured more broadly. Uh, funds are leaving these this, the regional banks to move into the larger banks, which are declared systemically important financial institutions. I think it's very unlikely this will infect them, so I don't think anything like 2008-9 when there, was, there were concerns of whether Citibank or Bank of America might go under, Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs almost went under. So I think that they're less leveraged, they have more capital, that's the good news, but it's likely there's going to be a slowdown. And the thing that I would emphasize is, well, it's not nearly going to be as bad as 2008-9, there must be some other financial institutions out there that are going to have problems. And the financial markets being the financial markets, they'll be tested. So there'll be more failures of this. So it's going to be, uh, be nerve-wracking for a while. Christy? So let me, let me second some of the things that, that Michael said. I, I think we clearly have had some uh, stress in the banking system the past couple of weeks. I, I take a fair amount of comfort from the fact that it seems to be settling down, that we are uh, dealing with Silicon Valley Bank. We just heard they just got bought. Um, I think the government responded very forcefully and effectively. Uh, and so I agree. I, I'm hopeful that this will be a definite bump, but not uh, anything that, that really mushrooms. In terms of the overall economy, I mean, one thing you have to realize, we actually, for all the uncertainty and, and things going wrong, we need to take a step back and, and say, you know, the unemployment rate is 3.6%, which um, is lower than I ever expected we'd be uh, seeing, you know, this soon after the pandemic. So the economy has had a lot of, as has been described, resilience. Consumers are spending. They have a lot of saving that they, um, uh, accumulated during the pandemic. And so we do have these sources of strength. The, the big concern I have is inflation. Uh, and inflation, you know, we'd hoped it would kind of come down. Maybe it was all supply problems and they'd end and it would just magically come down. That doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so the, really the only tool the government has to try to directly or indirectly deal with inflation is the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, trying to slow the economy down. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing. And um, you know, my, the, the very fact that inflation is not coming down quickly, I think, means the Fed's going to stick with this. And historically, when you raise interest rates about five percentage points, you are going to see a slowdown in the economy. Now, whether it is just some additional unemployment, but not a really big rise, not a really big fall in output, so maybe not enough to call it a recession. There will, as Michael said, there will be some pain. And unfortunately, that's the kind of the only way we have to try to, to, try to get it down. So um, I think we all just need to pre be prepared uh, that we're, we're in for a bit of a tough time. Um, but my hope is that we, we get through it. When people talk about a soft landing, what they mean is exactly what I've been describing. Can we get inflation down by having 
unemployment just a little bit above normal, that's what we call a soft landing. We kind of gradually get inflation down without too much pain. That's what everyone hopes. That's, um, it's going to take a, a certain amount of luck and some really good policy making. But that's, that's the good scenario. And then I think kind of the bad scenario is it's worse than that. I don't, like Michael, I don't see the chances of a, a really big recession, something that, that was like in any way 2009. Um, but that, that would be the fear, and that's what we're all going to be looking out for. John? Um, I am going to answer that question, but before that, you know, journalists don't often get to say stuff like this, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. It is a privilege to participate in a conversation led by one of the finest public servants of my lifetime or anybody's lifetime. Um, I, I'm not old enough to have covered Leon when he was a Republican serving in the Nixon administration. <laughs> I was in Washington, but I was in grade school. But I am old enough to have covered him in the House as chairman of the House Budget Committee, as the country's budget director in the Clinton administration, uh, as White House Chief of Staff, uh, then as CIA Director, and as uh, Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration. There may be, uh, surely there are, other people who've served in that many high offices so uh, effectively, but it's a short list, and I'm not sure anybody's got a better bumper sticker than I balanced the budget and I got Osama bin Laden. So <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, In terms of the uh, state of the economy, you know, I, I'm a journalist. My views are derivative of people like my colleagues on the panel who I talk to. And the, the striking thing to me is how uncertain all of them are. I remember a conversation I had with um, uh, Dr. Romer's old colleague, Jason Furman, from the uh, Obama administration right when Biden was taking office. And Jason said, man, they're so lucky in the Biden administration with Obama you know, the economy was collapsing when we took over. We passed a, a plan, but we knew things were going to get worse for a while, and so we were going to get a lot of blame for that. The economy's coming back really strong, and Biden's going to pass a rescue plan, and he'll be able to say, look at what my policies are doing. The economy's great. Well, it didn't exactly work out the way um, uh, everybody expected or the way Jason expected. Um, it's always a matter of probabilities. You know, whether you're going to have a recession, there's a chance that you're always going to have one in any uh, year. Clearly, those are elevated, and the banking um, turmoil that we've been going through has elevated it more. But I don't think it's a certainty that, that um, uh, we're going to have a recession. Uh, clearly, Fed Chair Powell believes there's a chance of a soft landing. Uh, the chief economist at Goldman Sachs thinks that that is still the likelihood that we will have a soft landing, uh, not a recession though he grades that uh, possibility a little bit less than it used to be. So um, uh, the outstanding characteristic of the economy right now is the uh, inability to have a clear focus, a clear picture on how the pandemic has changed economic conditions in ways that uh, might mean that some historical markers that we've used in the past uh, may, not be, may not mean the same thing as they have in the past. Uh, don't know how many, uh, what the future of work is going to be. Some people dropping out of the workforce, the shape of the workforce, certainly the in-person workforce is changing. Um, so I would say that, generally speaking, the economy is not that bad. Uh, in fact, it's pretty good. Uh, but there is a significant inflation problem that needs to be uh, dealt with. And the only question is, we know it's headed down, but we don't know how fast it's headed down. And we don't know how much of a push it's going to take to get it down that last bit that uh, will be acceptable to the Fed, and how many people, how many uh, people are going to lose their jobs, or, or how much economic pain is going to be necessary before that happens. But uh, I, I would say, as a, uh, a glass half full person, I think we still have at least a significant chance of avoiding a recession. Maya. Um. Great to be with everybody. I will say, as a glass half empty person, I also think we have a decent chance of avoiding a recession. So that's good news. Um, listen, we are in a really tough situation. We are in a three way vice right now between the risk of continued inflation, the risk of recession, and a, the risk of a banking contagion. 
And that is a really tricky place to be in because almost any policy that the Fed chooses to pursue is going to hurt part of that while it helps the other part. Um, so the reason, and, and there's so much uncertainty around all this, uncertainty is always bad for the economy. The reason I'm still feeling pretty good, which I think means maybe we avoid a recession, or more likely, if we do have a recession, it will be relatively brief and relatively shallow. Um, we have seen a remarkable resilience in our economy recently in the past years that I don't think we expected that shows us some things about our economy are working better than they used to and actually able to um, endure some difficult challenges. The employment numbers are strong. Layoffs have been really concentrated in, in the tech industry, but not widespread at all. I think workers, uh, companies are going to be hesitant to lay off workers because it's been so hard to get them. And so I think there are a lot of things moving in the right direction. Um, I'll just say what I think the risks are to look for. Um, energy, which was one of the big contributors, right? There were, there were three things that sort of got us to the inflationary moment. Poor fiscal policy, supply chains, energy, and, and the shock in Ukraine. Energy could still be a big shift where that could change everything on a dime. Um, uh, after the bank situation, which I think is looking as though it's resolving itself relatively well, there could be enduring problems or, or changes in regulation that lead to a real credit crunch, which could actually mean we don't see the recession this year, as is being predicted by most people, as much as that you could see it in the out years. So there's not, just because we make it through 2023, things aren't as perfect uh, as one might hope or, or don't rest quite as calmly. Um, but then there's the big issue in my field, fiscal policy. If we get close to this debt ceiling and it's not resolved, and if there really is talk of default, and if we default, all bets are off, right? Suddenly the economy could go into absolute chaos. So I think there are a lot of unknowns. And again, uncertainty is one of the worst things there is for the economy. Certainty is always sort of the, the free, cheap stimulus that helps create, uh, create a boost. Um, and it just seems like it's a world filled with uncertainty. So it's not easy to be completely confident in much of anything right now. Let me, uh, I did a, didn't have to do much research, but the last four presidents have put out a lot of federal money uh, in order to deal with economic issues. Uh, George Bush in 2008 obviously faced the problems uh, then, plus General Motors and Chrysler. Uh, Barack Obama uh, had to deal also with the automakers financing. Uh, and also passed a sweeping recovery package, $787 billion. Uh, Donald Trump, obviously hit by the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, pumped almost $2.2 trillion uh, relief bill into the economy. And Joe Biden passed a $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. The reason I mention this is because uh, we now decided with the banking crisis that we would protect all depositors beyond the FDIC limits of 250,000. And I guess my question is, was that a right step to take? Did it create a bad precedent for the future? Uh, are we looking at the need to bail out future banks and all of the depositors? Uh, that's, there seems to be a mixed signal whether that's the policy, but it certainly seems that politically they're locked in a corner. Uh, are they gonna have to do that, Michael? Well, I would hope not. Uh, I think it's a bad idea to insure all deposits everywhere. I think that lessens market discipline, creates a lot of moral hazard, and will cause a problem down the line that may be even bigger. Uh, I do believe when you're stuck in a situation, sometimes you have to hold your nose and do something. Uh, I, I, I wasn't sure that doing with this was necessary for Silicon Valley Bank. I think they probably could have withstood a day or two and continued the sales process. But they did it, and it's assumed in some quarters that that means any other modest-sized regional bank will be bailed out, let alone the ones we've labeled expressly under Dodd-Frank as systemically important financial institutions, the big banks, big uh, investment banks, and a couple of insurance companies. So I worry about it. I, I think that they had to do something under the circumstances. And usually the FDC will come in on a Friday clean the thing up, separate out the bad assets, reopen on Monday morning, either having sold it or shut it down and sold off the assets or something. Uh, so I think that perhaps 
They, they could have extended for a bit longer, but I don't want to be hypercritical of this. I do think they're going to have to clarify whether all other depositors are fine, and they're probably going to have to clarify it in the next month or so, because the banks that put deposit, the large banks, JP Morgan, let it, et cetera, the money put into, uh, into First Republic, um, may, may or may not be enough, number one, and number two, it's only, they're only saying they're going to hold it there for, they're only guaranteed to hold it there for 90 days. So something's going to have to be worked out in that instance. I think w the biggest risk of a problem in the economy from uh, a few more smaller banks failing uh, would be in the commercial real estate sector. Uh, which is already reeling from the big rise in interest rates. There's not a lot of new home building being planned right now. That means fewer homes are being built, fewer carpets and, and appliances will be sold to fill them up, et cetera. So I think there are spots of the economy this may come, come out, but I would hope we could have much more targeted interventions and get back to a principle, maybe we should raise this, maybe we should index the 250 for inflation or whatever. We get back to a principle that people operating with, with full information and full information about government policy should be able to take their own risk, reap the gain, and bear the consequences if it doesn't work out. Christy, what do you think? So, I mean, I think they, I think they did the right thing. I think in a situation where um, you're, there's some threat that this could spread to perfectly solvent banks and bring them down, you just don't mess around. And so, um, you know, I think it was, I think it was a sensible policy. I do think it's really important, right? The amount of money we're talking about, right? I think the the estimate is that the FDIC is going to have to use up. Twenty billion dollars of their um, of their insurance fund, so it's not directly coming out of you know government revenues. That's what this fund is there for, is for dealing with uh, situations like that. So um, I think it's a, a completely different order of magnitude than the trillions and trillions, for example, that we spent uh, on the pandemic. The other thing to say is is I do think we need to realize we've been through just a lot of really hard times. I mean, if someone had told me we'd have a financial panic and a pandemic, those were two things I was pretty sure I would never see in my lifetime. And suddenly we've seen uh, both of them in the, in the last 15 years. So I think that, that though it, you tell a compelling case that we do keep <clears throat> having to you know, take these extreme measures, these have been extreme times. John, uh, whether they say so or not, I think it's plain for the political reason, um, if not the economic reason that Leon mentioned, that they are in fact going to guarantee the deposits of anybody over 250,000 uh, beyond what is what is uh, by law um, uh, uh, guaranteed. Um, and, and I also though think it's important to clarify the terms. I, it doesn't seem to me that it was a bailout of the Silicon Valley Bank. It was a bailout of the depositors in the Silicon Valley Bank, which were um, uh, uh, business people, very wealthy people, uh, and some small businesses uh, run by people who aren't so wealthy. And I think it would be very difficult in a future situation with a regional bank with a somewhat less affluent clientele to say, you bailed out the guys in Silicon Valley Bank, the, the you know, yeah, uh, crypto guys, the tech guys, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. in that bank, and you're not going to bail out this bank in small town Ohio. Um, you know, I, the reality is there aren't that many people who uh, plan ahead the way the uh, basketball star Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, did. He gave an interview after this thing happened, said he had 50 different bank accounts, each with no, hundred, no more than $250,000 in them. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's foresight. Uh, but there's not many people who do that. So, um, but, but I think, yes, I, I, I think there, there is a de facto uh, guarantee. And uh, I think the moral hazard issue is real, but I think that's the reality of it. Maya, what do you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a great policy. Um, I don't think bailouts are good. I don't think bailing out people who don't need to be bailed out is good at, the time, at this time in our country sort of moment of economic resentment. Uh, I don't think it's good for moral hazard, but if I had been in the room, I would have completely supported the bailout, and I think it was the right thing to do. 
I think it also makes me realize we kind of have to recognize that our economy has become so complicated, so interdependent, and so um, run by politicians who don't like to do hard things, and we are not used to doing hard things ourselves, that it's probably going to be a pattern that continues. And so we may want to update our thinking a little bit more to understand uh, that these are the systems in place. And I don't know if that means it leads to more regulation to avoid these things or to understand kind of stress tests, stress tests beyond just the banking sector but throughout the economy. But I think recognizing that this pattern is a pattern that's probably here to stay would be in our best interest. Maya, while I have you, uh, I, you know, I mentioned uh, the amount of money that has been poured back into the economy for whatever reason. Uh, and you know the end result of uh, a lot of that, uh, plus big tax cuts, et cetera, uh, has resulted now in this 31 plus trillion dollar uh, national debt. Uh, there are consequences to that. I mean, most, most people think that, especially in Washington, that you can go on this ride for a long time and that uh, it's never going to catch up to you. Uh, I guess my question is, in addition to the problems we just discussed, is there going to be a time soon when it's going to catch up to us? Yeah. I mean, one of the problems, I think, with fiscal policy and pushing for responsible fiscal policy is that you don't see the direct costs at the moment. Um, and so we have been borrowing excessively. Um, and I don't mean there are many times you should borrow. We, we should borrow for some of these emergencies. We should certainly have borrowed during COVID. We should have certainly borrowed during the, the economic, the Great Recession. Um, but if you borrow too much, uh, it weakens your economy. There's crowding out. We, our economy is probably slower, has slower growth now and a lower standard of living than it would have if we hadn't borrowed so much in the past for things that weren't important. It weakens your ability to be available for the next emergency. So the real risk is when the next emergency hits, and it will hit, will we be able to borrow so painlessly? It weakens our position geopolitically. There is a reason that people like you, who are secure, national security experts, see a huge linkage between our weak fiscal position and what that means for our strength globally. And it weakens our ability to adapt and change as there are new threats and new changes in our economy. And I'll just say, like, if you look at our social contract, it's completely outdated. There are so many new threats. We basically have a social contract for last century instead of this century, but we don't even have the flexibility in our budget to update it and think about those things. But the risk in this particular situation is because we borrow when there are emergencies, but we also borrow when things are great. I mean, the economy pre-COVID was going gangbusters, and we borrowed for tax cuts. We borrowed for spending increases, some more tax cuts. Um, and since we, the economy strengthened since COVID, we've borrowed for all of the policies many policies that, that you might think were great ideas, whether it's infrastructure or chip spill, all those things, those were debt financed. They weren't paid for, even though the economy would have said we should have. We've lost the pattern where we used to borrow in bad times and then bring the deficit down and save in good times. And that's what you need to do to avoid the situation where we are now, where our debt's growing faster than our overall economy, our interest payments are going to triple over the next decade, fastest growing part of the federal budget, they will be higher, more than we spend on defense in five years. Um, and you have trust funds, Social Security and Medicare, that are headed towards insolvency. So yes, this habit of, fit, of borrowing that we are now in, and I think it's almost a political necessity, people are very unwilling to say, here's what I want to do to reduce the deficit, means we're incredibly weak um, in terms of our fiscal foundation and our ability to weather the next crisis when it comes along. The level of vulnerability that it leaves us with, I think, is very unwise, very dangerous. So uh, it raises the, uh, the political issue why Democrats and Republicans don't like to deal with it. Um, because, I mean, in, in our day, Michael, when Michael was there with, in the Bush administration uh, and I was chair of the Budget Committee, uh, we actually went to Andrews Air Force Base to negotiate uh, a deficit reduction package of, turned out to be $500 billion, uh, which was a lot in those days. And it was done on a bipartisan basis, by the way. Uh, so both parties recognized the importance of dealing with it. Uh, I think over the last uh, you know, 12, 15 years, the budget process is broken in Washington. They have not passed a budget resolution in 20 years. 
neither the House Budget Committee or the Senate Budget Committee. They have not passed a, a budget resolution. So it's obvious that neither Republicans or Democrats are very interested in making the hard decisions that you need in order to deal with this problem. Yeah. Uh, I guess the question is, is, is the leadership of both parties ultimately going to face this challenge, or are they just going to allow it to continue until crisis drives something? Um, John? One quick postscript to, to what Maya said. It also matters you know, when you, when you <laughs> borrow money to spend, it also matters when you do that and under what circumstances. So just to take one little thought experiment here, uh, when the Obama administration came in and the economy was in free fall, they passed a $787 billion stimulus plan. Uh, the Biden administration passed a $1.9 trillion uh, uh, COVID relief plan in the beginning of their administration. I believe I'm right that Dr. Romer, as head of the CEA, advocated a much larger stimulus package at that time than $787 billion because of the threat to the economy. I would postulate that if you just flip those two numbers <laughs> and pass the $1.9 trillion in 2009 and pass the $787 billion in 2021, that you would have a stronger economy and lower deficits as a result of that because our re recovery would not have been so slow. Um, on, on your question, yes, the, both parties will deal with the uh, debt and deficit situation, but the question is how bad will conditions have to get before they do that? Um, I had a very depressing conversation about two years ago with a, a policy director for uh, Senate Republican leader McConnell, and he was very uh, gloomy about this, and he said, yes, there's gonna be a big budget deal, and the big budget deal's probably gonna come 10 years from now when we're on the brink of some catastrophe, and that will be the action-forcing mechanism. Um, it is very difficult under current circumstances to do it. They tried to make a deal when Barack Obama was president. Um, ultimately, the only way to make a deal is if Democrats agree to cut spending and Republicans agree to raise taxes. E each of those are the things that the party doesn't want to do, but they have to do them. Um, the deal never got done when Obama was president in predominant part in my uh, view, because Republicans would not raise taxes at all. In fact, since uh, Michael Boskin was chair of the CEA and President George H.W. Bush had the guts to cut that budget deal with Leon Panetta as chair of the budget committee that raised taxes and cut spending, since that time, the 33 years since then, no Republican in Congress has voted to raise tax rates at all. Until that changes, we're not going to have a deal. It will change. Uh, I just don't know how quickly that's going to happen. Michael? Yeah, I, w I want to just add a little bit of color on, um, on a, f a few things that I mostly agree with. One is, of course, during a deep recession, you should let the automatic stabilize work. You'd run a big deficit, any a big increase in the deficit anyway. It was going to last a while, and you can implement it in time, and it was set up in a way that had as little long-run co co costs and consequences as possible. Maybe you should do something in addition. But even the godfather of deficit spending, John Maynard Keynes, the intellectual godfather, said you should run surpluses in good times. And we've gotten away from that. It's sort of become uh, modest deficits in good times and large deficits right. in bad times. Uh, and that's not a recipe for doing, doing very well. I do want to make a, a couple of points about it doesn't just matter the size of these things. And you shouldn't think of this just as a, uh, an arithmetic problem. Um, there's substantial evidence looking at all the successful budget consolidations in the OECD countries over many decades, that the ones that are successful in a the sense they make a big chunk in getting the budget back in some sort of order, more sustainable path, et cetera, without causing a recession, have much more on the spending reduction side than on the tax increase side. Uh, there are many studies that show pretty large effects of tax hikes uh, or tax cuts, and uh, the ones on the spending side are a bit, uh, a bit more mixed and tend to be smaller than was traditionally taught. In Keynesian economics when I was an undergraduate. I do think it also matters what you spend on and what you tax. There are some things it makes sense to spend more on. 
Some things are in the nature of investment. Think the interstate highway system. Think of FDR financing three-fourths of World War II with debt. Those are all quite sensible decisions. That's different from financing a lot more consumption on the, uh, at the behest of government transfers for well-off people, uh, which we do too much of in our society. Um, so it's important to look at the detail as well. I do think that um, Republicans have become averse to tax hikes partly because they feel that the spending reductions they were promised uh, didn't all materialize in future Congresses, number one. And number two, I would draw a little bit of a, of a different conclusion than you would, John. And Maya, you had a very good explanation of this earlier today, and you might want to add it. But they're dealing with different baselines about where taxes are headed and where spending's headed and why and whether that makes sense. Uh, and they have different views about the size of government, which intersects and in some, many cases trumps, if you pardon the use of that term, their views about fiscal policy affecting the economy. They're more about the size of government, personal responsibility versus government being more involved in our lives, government being a last resort not a f or a first resort, et cetera. I want to add one additional perspective from my many years of in government and advising governments here and around the world. Uh, I think it was, was a Rahm Emanuel that had the quip, never let a good crisis go to waste. I think that's the exactly wrong time to be making serious long-term policy decisions. I think those are the worst circumstances. Think about it. In, in, a, in a, reset, a deep recession or a depression, the, the needs are exigent. People are really suffering. We saw this in, uh, in the COVID and earlier in the deep recessions in the early 80s and mid 70s and uh, 2009, et cetera. There are a lot of people really hurting and you want to be able to do something to help them. You want to give them support, et cetera. But it becomes very difficult to titrate those programs down when they should be titrated down. And in booms, everything seems affordable. People are extrapolating the cost of these things and the growth of the economy, and everything seems affordable, and we wind up putting in things that are way too expensive under very optimistic assumptions, and I think that's kind of been the history of the growth of government in the United States. And I would have preferred policies that dealt with these problems in a more targeted way that uh, had far fewer longer-term consequences. So, uh, Christy, I mean, what, you're an economist. Uh, tell me, when, what will be the impact if we ignore this huge growing debt? Uh, I mean, how will, it, how will it impact on the economy? Um, well, first, let me just second what John said. You, you don't know how many times as the various COVID relief things went through, I said, what we could have <laughs> done with that money. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, the, that 2009, the world really was falling apart and it, it needed a, a fair amount more help. Um, you know, I think the, what, what Maya said was, it was exactly right, that, that there are certainly debt by itself. You know, I often say it doesn't cause a problem until it does. And the trouble is you don't know when it's going to cause a problem. Uh, and it's when people finally wake up and say, gee, I don't think they're going to be able to repay all that. Uh, and then suddenly you can't borrow and, and you're in a real mess. And so, you know, that is the one you kind of have to keep in the, in the back of your head. And that's a, a reason for um, you know, keeping it. Uh, keeping it under control. So I think that's a, a big one. But I, I do like the point, we shouldn't just think, you know, and, and I think Democrats were at least as uh, guilty of this as, as Republicans in the last few years of people kind of saying, oh, deficits don't matter anymore. I think Maya and I were on a panel where they, you know, should we learn to love the deficit? And we're both God. sitting there, no, right? It, it, because it, it does, you know, even if it doesn't cause a crisis, it is. You are um, sending some of our hard earned money abroad to pay off your bondholders who've been uh, lending us things. And so we are, in effect, poorer. And our children are, in effect, poorer. And so that is, I, I think, the, a very real consequence that, you know, without a panic, you still really want to, to keep your fiscal house in order. So you're saying modern monetary theory is baloney? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, abso <laughs> absolutely. And we've proved yeah. that recently, right? Let me ask uh, each of you before I, I'm going to break uh, to get questions from the audience. Uh, on the debt limit uh, crisis, uh, where right now 
we're not we're not sure whether the Congress is going to be able to put the votes together to extend uh, the uh, the debt limit, which which has to be extended in order to protect the good faith and credit of the United States. Uh, we've been through these crises before. Let me ask each of you: uh, Will will this Congress be able to pass a debt limit extension? Maya. Yes, the probability is yes, um, but that is not 100 percent. And I'm very, I mean, I've never thought this before. I've never thought that there was an actual possible possibility of default. I think there is a deal to be had. I think it could be a reasonable deal that would uh, generate some savings in the short term for one or two years and hopefully combine that with some kind of a commission that would look at the longer term needs to bring our spending and our, our revenues into alignment. I think. Um, they should negotiate that through the budget process rather than on the debt ceiling, so get it done. Um, unfortunately, the budget committees, once again, don't seem to be showing up to do their jobs, and there are no budgets. They're supposed to be figured out by April 15th, and that is quickly coming. Um, but I, I think, listen, there are more people in, the, in Congress who want to pass the debt ceiling, many, many more than those who don't. The problem is there are procedural barriers. And it will be up to uh, McCarthy whether he wants to put something on the House floor or they want to figure out the politics of getting something done. But I think there are enough people who understand the absolute imperative to get it done. Um, gosh, I wish I were more confident. But yes, we're going to pass the debt ceiling. <laughs> John, yes or no? Yes, they're going to pass it. It's going to be torture getting there. Well, I'm just an economist, but I'm really scared. <laughs> so it's it's less, I, I feel, I mean, we're all having, I think, a, a rational view that this would be so catastrophic that surely no one would do this. And I'm just, I'm afraid I'm just not confident. I, I think they're, you know, because what could well happen is it would have to pass the House with a lot of, you know, if McCarthy's going to lose some of his Republicans, he's going to have to be willing to pass it with Democratic votes. And I'm not sure he's going to be willing to do that. So that's, that's my nightmare scenario. Yeah. So I'm, I guess I'm usually optimistic, and this is one where I'm not. Michael? I give the majority the probability that it will pass. Um, and if it doesn't, I give them the majority, the large majority, the remaining probability will pass a few days later after a short-term yep. kerfuffle that scares everybody into doing it. Uh, and the bond bid, so we have, bid aspect. we have to go off the cliff. Well, I have some sympathy. I mean, Washington has always been a town that worked to deadlines. <laughs> and nothing gets done until you have to. And so I have some sympathy for people who want to use this as a forcing event to get the budget under control. It's been out of control for a long time. Uh, but uh, this would not be the optimal way to do it, to be sure. John, I also want to ask you to go back and, with all due respect, review your history about what Boehner offered, yeah. which was a sizable tax increase that Obama eventually said wasn't large enough and pulled out of the negotiations. So it's not, you're not quite accurate. You're generally accurate, but that there's, there have been exceptions. <laughs> um, well, okay. It, it occurred to me they that... They haven't voted for it. No, no, they haven't <laughs> voted for it. It's accurate because they... The only, the only revenue he offered was dynamically scored revenue. He did not offer static revenue. That's, that's not correct. That's not quite accurate, but anyway, that's <laughs> good. Right. I believe it is true. In any, of, in, any event, right. in any event, the tax code in general as a tax code should have broader, broader bases and lower rates. That used to be the position of um, the leaders of both parties, including intellectual leaders and Democratic Party, but they moved away from that to wanting much higher tax rates for distributional reasons. You can like that or not like that, but. The, the fiscal policy side of this and the effects on the economy from the fiscal policy has been, have been deeply commingled with other priorities. Let me take a moment, uh, if I can, at this point, to recognize our question review team. They're the people responsible for selecting questions that will be presented to our speakers. And I'd ask you to hold your applause while I introduce the entire group. Uh, Mike Clancy, who is a contributor with the Cedar Street Times. David Kellogg, managing editor of the Monterey Herald. Ray uh, Masiecki, who's a reporter with the Monterey County Weekly, and Doug McKnight, who's a reporter with KAZU Radio. If you would uh, thank them, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Sylvia and I also want to thank the Panetta Institute Board of Directors and our lecture series sponsors that make these programs possible. Uh, and allow us to share these discussions with all of you, the audience that's watching at home, and all
Also with our students, we had uh, a large number of students uh, for a program with the speakers. Uh, the students come from Central and Northern California. It was a great session. So please give our sponsors a hand too, if you would. Okay, uh, how would you grade Jerome Powell's performance? Uh, and let me just add, did he, did uh, the Fed take too long uh, to act on inflation? Michael? Yes, I think with what th they had been infused with a review of how they conducted monetary policy in an era of low interest rates. And I think they became um, too convinced that they had to deal with that in a way that changed their behavior. They could run a hot economy. They could worry about inflation later and it could get above 2% for, for a while and they could always get it under control. And I think that that was a historical, uh, we had a very slow recovery for many reasons from the financial crisis, great recession, without a big surge of inflation, and maybe that colored their thinking and other people's thinking. But yes, they acted too late. Christy? A little bit. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, to, be, to be fair, I mean, the problem for monetary policymakers for the last, again, since, you know, even before, well, certainly since 2008, has been how do we get inflation up to our goal of 2%, right? They were, were terrified that they were going to have deflation or to, to not be able to hit their, uh, their target rate of, of inflation. And everybody says, look at Japan. They have now had 25 years where they couldn't hit their, their target rate of inflation. So that's why I, I grant them a little slack. Um, that, that it was a, a big change. It happened very fast in a, a pretty unusual circumstance, which obviously was coming out of a, a worldwide pandemic. But yes, they were, they were slow, um, but they've certainly made up for it. So in a year, they have, have raised rates by you know, five percentage points. So um, they're, they're on the ball now. Okay, the economic uh, sanctions imposed on Russia in response to the invasion of Ukraine have not been as effective as uh, had been hoped. Uh, why is that and what can be done to put stronger economic pressure on Russia? John, take a shot at it. Um, well, I don't know how you judge the success of sanctions in this situation. Uh, I mean, they've clearly had some effect. Um, they've not made Russia uh, uh, withdraw or, or uh, end the war, but on the other hand, sanctions combined with the um, unity among Western allies has uh, uh, really uh, frustrated most of uh, Moscow's military aims. So I think the effort in total has been pretty successful. Um, and so I, I, I don't know how you necessarily suss out the discrete uh, influence of sanctions versus the military assistance and the diplomatic leadership. Michael? I think there's a simple answer to that question. China and India. Yep. They're buying Russian oil. That's a pr predominant earner of funds for the Moscow, tr for, for Putin's treasury. Um, I think they have had some effect. I think that the extended war has caused problems for Putin economically. Uh, but I'll remind you that Russia has been a country that has borne unbelievable hardship, far beyond anything we have in our wars, uh, and come out the other end. And I think if you want to understand Vladimir Putin, you should read uh, Robert Massey, this great Princeton historian's biography of Peter the Great, because I think Putin is above all a Russian who wants to reestablish Russia's empire. Uh, not necessarily in, in traditional monarchical terms, but greater Russia. And, um, I think he's prepared to bear a lot of costs for it. So I would have a friendly corollary to John's point, which is I think Russia's military proved badly, um, badly inept at the start of this. But um, unless it ends in the not too distant future, they have numbers on their side relative to the Ukrainians and it, it, it could go on for quite a while and they could grind the Ukrainians down and that would be horrible for everybody. Maya, uh, is it uh, possible to create another Simpson-Bowles-type plan to balance the budget, or are we too divided? Uh, 
Yes to both. Um, so I think we have to. I think we have to come up with another model that's much like Simpson Bowles because what that came up with is actually still the answer today, except it has to be bigger because the problem is worse. Um, there already is a commission proposal out there that I think is probably the next best hope, uh, which is called the Trust Act. It's both bipartisan and bicameral. The sponsors are Mitt Romney, Joe Manchin, Mike Gallagher, and Ed Case. Um, and those are all some really helpful, influential people in the Senate and the House. What it would do is any, any program that has a trust fund that is going to become insolvent in 15 years, they would, up, they would put together a special task force that would work on dealing with those problems. Now, you would think that is hard to object to, right? There is a program, the, it is going insolvent, and Congress says we should take a look at that. Um, unfortunately, when they did come out with this bill, the AARP went all out opposing it and doing phone banking in people's districts and things like that. And so not only do I think it's more difficult because the polarization will make it very hard for them to actually come up with the recommendations, we know how to fix Social Security. You need to look at slowing the growth of benefits for people who can, can afford it, the retirement age, how you calculate inflation, and more revenues in the program. We know how to do it, but that is really hard for politicians to say. But on top of the polarization and the unwillingness to talk about those hard choices, you now have such um, a polarized advocacy community and so much money at stake that people are really like to make their issues huge problems because that's how they fundraise. So I think um, Simpson Bowles came this close to passing, and it didn't. I think the fiscal problem is harder now, and the environment is about 100 times worse now. So I'm pessimistic, but I think it's the best model that we have and that we have to try, and we have to hope for a opening of some kind of window where we can get something done. OK, uh, Michael, you're in Silicon Valley. Uh, high tech is being challenged in many ways. Uh, startup companies are impacted by the crisis, banking crisis. Thousands of workers have been laid off. Both Democrats and Republicans are concerned uh, that social media platforms like TikTok are being used by the Chinese for surveillance. Uh, we continue, they continue to be concerned over privacy and control of content. Uh, and we now have artificial intelligence and a lot of warnings about the future of that. What is the future of high tech? Can innovation continue with all of these questions being raised? Well, I think so and I hope so because amongst other things, the best and easiest answer although not easy to achieve, of how to deal with the budget would be stronger economic growth, which would generate a lot more revenue, would decrease the need for more social spending, and so on. So we ought to be putting all of our policies through a filter of what would affect the growth of the economy and try to avoid those that would damage whatever their benefit in some other dimension or some other priority, damage the economy's economic growth, its productivity growth, and its labor force participation and human capital accumulation. So I would hope so. I think that there are big challenges, and I think they're multidimensional. I think the problems with social media extend way, way beyond TikTok, which has the uh, additional uh, issue about the Chinese ownership. Uh, number one, uh, even though a majority of their board actually is, I think, American at this stage, but um, there, there's a, certainly a concern, and I think the concern is not primarily TikTok, it's primarily China. And that every time the Chinese send a spy balloon over, et cetera, that, that becomes the avenue for people to try to do something about it. Um, I think they have free speech issues. I think they have speech suppression issues. I think they have monopolization issues. And I think they have uh, their, um, their at times resistance to help our national security uh, because they have a bunch of woke youngsters running around who say we won't participate in a project as if uh, our Pentagon is, is corrupt during Hitler's time or something. It's just horrible. So I think all those things are going on, and there are different groups of people in the Congress and in the country, strange bedfellows at times, worried about any and all of those things. So I think that's going to have to be worked out, whether that's Section 230, that grants a lot of, uh, a lot of protection to, as publishers, et cetera, whether that's antitrust issues uh, and the like. But I do believe uh, myself from witnessing generations of Stanford students that despite the many good things that have come about from social media and technology for our children, smartphones and apps that 
uh, tie them together and actually get them lots of, inform lots of information that may or may not be accurate, by the way, with the poor filters or what it means. I think that there's a big concern that they're spending too much time on it and not enough time learning to think for themselves, learning to explore, to wonder, and things of that sort. So uh, I'm generally not a big regulatory guy, but I wish parents would, start, at the very least themselves, start enforcing a lot less time on these devices for their children. I just wanted Proceed. to add one thing about the tech industry, which I, I found very helpful, which is, you know, a, a, you know, when you when you think about why are why are we seeing the big layoffs there? One thing that that someone pointed out is. Um, when you invest in, in high tech, most of their research and development, that kind of investment, if it pays off, it's going to pay off probably in the very distant future. So a lot of the, the things that they're thinking about or wondering about are, are may have very high returns, but they're not going to have high returns tomorrow. And those are exactly the things that are very sensitive to interest rates. And so I think for a, a, something that's going to pay off in the distant future, raising interest rates as much as the Fed has done. I think that is a part of why we're seeing it, you know, things happening there rather than some fundamental, you know, we've forgotten all the good ideas kind of thing. I, I think it could be more of a cyclical phenomenon and they're just kind of at the, at the front end of this. It should be, I should have mentioned one other thing which relates to what you just said, Christy that the layoffs have not even brought them all the way down to their pre-pandemic growth trend. All the big companies just hired massively during COVID because there was a big shift in demand of their products because everyone was at home. Uh, so I think that that has to be borne in mind too. It's layoffs from a very elevated hiring. Maya, uh, earlier we talked about uh, this and uh, you expressed some concerns about artificial intelligence. And the reason I, I ask you is because at least in the last few weeks, there seems to be even more attention to whether or not we're going to be able to control what uh, artificial intelligence does, or, or is the genie out of the bottle? Uh, Fasten your seatbelts for this answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, we've been together all day, and I, I am a bit of a doomsdayer on the technology. I'm going to try to be upbeat. Um, listen, where we are with technology versus social media and then AI, we are doing a massive experiment on our brains and ourselves as humans without the ability to catch up and think through it. And I think it's Yuval Harari who says, like, the pace of technologists versus the pace of philosophers who regulate them are completely different. And we um, have already seen with social media that it has not just changed our brains, but changed our teenagers' brains. Um, but I won't make you raise your hand, but how many people have a hard time finishing reading books now? when we all used to read books all the time. Like, we know it's changing our brains. Part of what's going on with our polarization is the effect of technology, because how it has changed, and, and I, I work with neuroscientists to try to learn and understand this better, and I'm only beginning to a tiny bit, but it is changing the way that we process information in a way that we are not good with nuance, we are not good with impulse control, and this is these are the kinds of things that are leading to the quick responses and the angry responses that are helping drive polarization. That's just social media in the beginning. With AI, I think the ability to regulate something that is quickly going to be so much more knowledgeable, make us completely dependent on it. I mean, I, I asked my AI to write me an op-ed on the debt ceiling, and it was good enough that I said, I better put this away or I'm not going to be able to write in a couple years because we will lose our own skills as we become more dependent. But the bottom line is we are creating new ways of building systems that we are so dependent on and so vulnerable to being manipulated from, whether it's from outside sources or within, that they threaten our very systems. Both capitalism and democracy absolutely depend on truth and trust and information to function. You need to be able to have your own information and know that it is true to make choices on how you vote or make choices on what you buy. These things are all going to be changed dramatically by AI in a way that we are not thinking through, we are letting happen. And so I will not go to the dark place that I shared with all of you before, but I think there are the incredible- of humanity, okay, I think fine. was the <laughs> phrase that- Fine, was, fine, fine. <laughs> But I think we're going to get through the debt ceiling, so that's good news. <laughs> you know, I think the history of this will be a short-term victory. 
<laughs> the history of this is still to be written. If you look at the, the primary uh, inventions that have altered uh, things immensely over time, the inventors didn't even realize what their primary commercial applications would be, whether that was Marconi uh, try, was trying to compete with the telegraph when he invented, when he did his first transatlantic wireless broadcast, for example. He never envisioned, even envisioned mass broadcast radio, let alone cell phones or smartphones. Uh, Thomas Edison's most, uh, most, what engineers tell me was his most original invention was the phonograph. And it's alleged, I've never been able to run this down, but there are plenty of people who think that he actually sued to prevent it from being used for music because he invented it to help blind people. And uh, I could, Edison, and then James Watt was to lift water out of coal mines. He wasn't thinking about steam ships and steam locomotives. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what will eventually happen with all this stuff. But I do agree that um, it's not a good thing when the bulk of the country is either not in a position or not able to quickly absorb some of these things that are being done by a small fraction of society. That, that I think is a, is a great risk. And uh, so in that sense, I'm sympathetic to the concerns you're raising, Maya. When, when my Chris, kids were young, Disney did a movie called Smart House. Do any of you guys remember that movie? And it was about a family that had a house that did all these things automatically. It would make the meal, and it would turn the lights on and off and adjust the power and vacuum the rooms. And eventually, it came to like have dominion over the family. And there was a war between the house and the family now, it had a happy ending. happy ending. Ultimately, the family defeated the house, the smart house. Uh, but uh, I guess it's not fated that that will always end that way. Well, speaking of weird things, uh, <laughs> is, there, is there a role for cryptocurrency in our economy? <laughs> Christy, uh, talk, talk about uh, Cryptocurrency. I, so this is the, normally when I do one of these things, I say I'm happy to talk about absolutely anything except cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> because I will, I mean, so I'm not ashamed to say I don't understand it, and it makes me very nervous. And I feel very good that I had the good sense to never put any of my money into it. Um, so Michael, do you have... Maybe. Yeah, no, I, I, I've actually had to think about this some and teach some of it in an in a extra course I started teaching at Stanford, which unfortunately has become very large and demanding, but on personal finance. And um, so first of all, the underlying technology properly implemented, blockchain technology, is a very efficient yeah. technology. Think of it as a distributed ledger. That's being used increasingly inside large banks and so on. So I think there's something to that. I think that... Um, it's very risky to depend on private stuff that you don't understand and on things being fulfilled and on exchanges that may or may not exist when you go to redeem and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of people made a lot of money. Uh, Bitcoin's still worth something. It's not gone all the way to zero, um, but it's, it's down a lot. We started this course in March 2020, and the next week we had to go online and the stock market crashed because of COVID. And this was on the minds of every Stanford undergraduate who's, you know, whose roommate said, I just made a killing in crypto. You know, I took my 100 bucks and it's now worth $5,000 or something. So this, this is a big issue. I think the big issue is if there ever are really outside of China, uh, at the major, in the major currencies, uh, central bank digital currencies, it will disintermediate the private stuff other than the stuff that people want to keep private, like illegal activities and laundering money and getting money out of autocratic places like you know, the Middle East, someplace in the Middle East, and Russia, et cetera. Uh, that's where the early money came into crypto and what, was, what it was used for and tax evasion and things of that sort. Um, I think the central bank digital currencies are th something the Fed has waxed and waned more on, and the Chinese are doing it in an experiment in 28. They started in four cities, they're doing it in 28 now. And some people are concerned they'll get ahead of us and that technology will get embedded in other countries and so on. But I, I do think that um, the basic issue is it's much more efficient uh, if I don't have to go through a financial institution to go through the, the central bank and then back out to the other financial institution and back out. If it's just done directly, it could lower costs and be more efficient. But I think 
we live in a society where enough people don't trust the government, not always for the wrong reasons, by the way. Sometimes uh, it turns out that there's good reason to be worried, that they might want to surrender their privacy and let the central bank know about every transaction they're making. So I think we've got a long way to go before we get there. So I don't think crypto is going away. I think it's probably going to have other explosions, um, but we'll see. Um, oh, yeah. Just one thought on that, because I agree that blockchain is a really, really important technology. Crypto, I'm less sure. I'm not, I'm not sure what problem it's trying to solve. Well, you just laid out some that possibly it is, though I think their real weakness is also with the loss of control. The Fed no longer would have the same kind of control over the economy if crypto continued to grow. But what I do observe is I think there's going to be, if you think about the, the GameStop kind of situation and you think about crypto, I think we're going to see more and more things where there are sort of bubble-like situations in our economy by influencers. Elon Musk was a huge piece of this. And the fact that we have this new kind of influencer economy where when some people start to say, do something or invest in this thing, there becomes a Ponzi scheme-like situation where I never believed in crypto, but I was pretty certain a lot of millionaires were going to, there were going to be a ton of millionaires and I was not going to be one of them. And that still sort of bothered me, even though I thought it wasn't a good idea. And I think we're going to see more of this where they're kind of bubble-like trends, and the real trick is how you get in and get out at the right time, which is terrible, right? You want an economy that's based on fundamental strengths, and I worry we're going into a new trend in a very different direction. Just saying, Elon Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion, yeah. <laughs> and he just valued it at $20 billion the other day, so <laughs> he could afford it. Did lax oversight by the Fed contribute to the recent failure of Silicon Valley Bank? And if so, what needs to be done about that? I'll say it was certainly a factor. I mean, there are um, you know, various factors. One is they had a sort of a uniquely flighty depositor base in the sense that these are people with lots of uninsured deposits. So I think that you know, already made them um, quite risky, because these are people that could, could pull out very quickly and pull a lot of money out quickly. Um, and then I think you know, we did, in uh, a couple of years ago, say, gee, we don't want to, you know, after the 2008 crisis, we absolutely put in lots more regulation. We were doing stress tests to make sure banks could stand up to you know, stressful conditions. And one of the things that got changed was they said, oh, gee, these, these kind of mid-sized banks, they aren't the really big ones. We're putting all these burdens on them. So we had taken off those burdens. And there was a lot of lobbying wanting to get those, you know, you know make banks like Silicon Valley Bank uh, not subject to some of the really stringent um, uh, regulations and, and procedures. And I think we are learning that came with consequences. And so, um, so yes, I think there, there was both a change in the law and maybe regulators were not watching as, as much as they should. Uh, I, would John, say, I think this is a situation where everybody screwed up. Uh, the uh, Congress screwed up by loosening the regulations. The Fed screwed up by inadequate oversight. The management of the bank screwed up by inadequate uh, risk management. And the depositors of the bank freaked out and triggered a run on the bank. So it's sort of, there were a lot of bad actors involved there. And the depositors had all these giant all deposits the above the insured mm -hmm. limit. Yeah, I, I would add a couple of other factors as well. So I think, I think I, I'd agree with what you said. First of all, the San Francisco Fed should have been fully aware, including the fact they didn't have a, a chief risk officer for eight months. Should have been a big signal, number one, they couldn't hire somebody or whatever was going on. The, the concentration of the lending and the banking relationships with a very small sector of the economy. We love technology. It's important in Northern California, but it's a small fraction of the whole economy. And, all the employment, it's not distributed widely uh, across sectors and across geography. But also important was the fact that the law that got changed for all its good intentions and some good it did with higher capital requirements and so on, um, led to a situation where financial institutions were, were told to bifurcate their assets and those that were being held for trading and those that were going to be held to maturity. So it meant if you bought a 10-year treasury and, and or a 30-year treasury even and marked it as hold to maturity, you eliminated, in addition to the, the lack of a default risk, you eliminated interest rate risk in some hypothetical sense if you kept it to maturity. 
But as soon as your depositors started to flee and you had to get cash to pay them, you had to sell it and take the loss. And that's exactly what happened in Silicon Valley Bank. So that wasn't really thought through very thoughtfully. And the combination of, of that designation, at a time where, by the way, all the Fed forecasts, their dot plots and all this sort of stuff, said inflation, interest rates were going to stay relatively benign, um, I think was a contributor. And uh, as usual, human beings do these things. We're often reacting to the last law. Uh, and the financial markets or other people will figure out a way to go to the limits and perhaps on occasion cross the limits. And we have to come back and figure out what went wrong. And in this case, it was a combination of things, including the fact that this hold to maturity stuff didn't make sense in a world where interest rates would be rising, especially abruptly. Let me, let me ask each of you, we're, we're about to uh, wrap up, but uh, I mentioned to the students uh, the poll that the Panetta Institute took where a majority of students said that uh, they were not going to have a better life than their parents, which meant that young people don't think they're going to be able to enjoy the American dream. Uh, I, I want to ask each of you, uh, as, as you, you talk to those young people, what do you think about the future of the American economy? I mean, in other words, where are, we, we know what the problems are we're confronting now. Uh, what do you think is the future uh, with regards to the American economy? Are they going to be able to ultimately enjoy the American dream, or are there problems out there? Maya? So if I had answered this question two months ago, before the AI situation, I would have said, I'm very worried for them. AI. Uh, we're leaving too much debt, and there are too many new problems. There are new threats around the world, and we haven't invested enough in them, and we should have done more on human capital, and our education system isn't what it should be. And now we've got a, a, a mental health crisis, which frankly is taking out a generation that I don't think we're giving enough attention to. Um, and so I would have been worried. Now I think the whole game is AI, and I think there's two scenarios. And one is we could create an absolute world of abundance. If we do this right, we could create so we could solve all the so many problems, create abundance. I'm not sure abundance is a great thing. I've started to think about what makes us feel satisfied, and I'm not sure having too much is the answer. But I'll take that scenario over the other. You know, AI takes us out as human scenario. That's the other one. But. Um, if this turns out to be something that we can't control and that we unleashed without the ability to either figure out how to control it or how to control its ability to be weaponized, then obviously they're going to have a lot worse life. And I think that um, that scenario is reasonably high. Uh, gosh, I'm glad I'm not the last speaker. John? <laughs> John, what do you think? Um, well, I'm going to reiterate uh, the uncertainty point that I made uh, earlier and uh, mention, tell one small personal story. I remember in 1990, I was writing a story about the economic future of the country, and it was at a time where there was rising attention to issues of in income inequality. And I interviewed a guy that uh, everybody up here knows, Bob Reischauer, um, who at that time was at the Urban Institute, he later became the Congressional Budget Office Director. And he said, well, it's really bad now. We, we don't have the will to you know, raise the money we need to make the investments that we need. But when you're, I just had a kid. He said, when, when your kid comes out of college in 2011, it's going to be an abundant economy. That their, their demography, demography is, means that people of her generation are going to have a huge uh, choice in jobs. Well, 2011, you know, we were coming out of a pretty bad financial situation, and I don't think it met Bob's prediction. Um, I think the one huge thing we've got to get over is the, that the demographic shift that we're undergoing means that baby boomers are retiring and there are fewer uh, workers uh, who are going to be around to pay the taxes to support my social security benefits. We need more workers and that means we need more immigration. Immigration is a toxic word in American politics right now. And that's a very difficult uh, hump to, to get over. However, uh, you have to decide sort of temperamentally if you're an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist by, by, um, by uh, uh, temperament. And so my assumption is that, as in many of these other challenges, ultimately, after 
a lot of uh, uh, anguish, we, we ultimately do the things we need to do to thrive and, and have the country move forward. And I have to say, I'm confident we'll do that again. Okay, Christy? So I think uh, I, I come down on a, a fairly optimistic side. And, and it, it, it has elements of, of both Maya and John, which is, one, I think we do get a little um, caught up in the, you know, I want my life to be better than my parents. And I'm not quite sure what that means. So it can mean material things. Mm -hmm. When I see my, my own three kids, I think they all value time you know, to the, you know, not, they're not as interested in working the 80 hours a week that, you know, they have different values. And so I think they may be, will not have perhaps the, the you know, a noticeably greater material standard, but I think they may be happier. Mm -hmm. And the other is just coming as an economic historian. I mean, I think people have probably said, the steam engines, you know, are going to be the end of humanity. Uh, certainly, the nuclear weapons are going to be the end of humanity. Yeah. You know, right, we, we go on and on, and yet we seem to keep muddling through. And I actually think, you know, each generation is going to have the chance to to make their way. And I guess I'm pretty optimistic that Michael, you get to wrap up here. Okay. Well, first of all. I, I myself remain somewhat cautiously optimistic. I want to remind everybody that most of the investment that goes on in society is not done in the government, and that's proper. Most investment is private investment by business firms, by people investing in their own human capital with the types of jobs and learnings they do, et cetera. Uh, and that's important to keep that vibrant and successful. It's certainly true that a successful society in the end is going to need an effective government, and that means adequately funding the necessary functions of government, and right now, I think most of the argument about what's necessary and what's beyond necessary and ought to be scaled back. I hope we do a lot of that scaling back for things that aren't necessary and do a much better job of adequately funding and adequately implementing the necessary functions of government. I'll give you one simple example, sadly, on our own state. One year after the COVID crisis, California still had one million backlogged unemployment insurance claims. The most desperate people couldn't get money a year afterwards. So we need to shore that up. It's mostly if we maintain a healthy, vibrant, mixed capitalist society where government is primarily the last resort when necessary, not the first resort, and we keep strong incentives to promote economic growth, to work, save, invest, and innovate, I think we'll be fine. We'll have lots of kerfuffles. We'll have lots of problems. We'll make it through. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me just add my two cents. I, I always tell the students at the Panetta Institute that in a democracy, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and is, makes the tough decisions that need to be made, we can avoid crisis. Otherwise, we'll govern by crisis. I think the real test is what kind of leadership we have for this country. Uh, and if we have the right kind of leadership, then I think uh, our kids will have a great future. Uh, in the meantime, I want you to thank all of these speakers for all they presented here this evening.